Hello and welcome to the Friday, October 27th, 2023 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I am recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Today I wrote about uh, validating IPv4 addresses, something that I've mentioned a few times before here in this podcast whenever, well, there was yet another vulnerability related to that. The tricky part is that IPv4 addresses can be represented as a number of different formats. And if you're trying to do proper input validation, well, you have to be careful what format you're dealing with. It's a little bit different than what, for example, Jesse and Didier have been talking about about in the past we sort of talked about obfuscating ipv4 addresses to make them more difficult to find this is really more when you're for example having a web application that reaches out to another web server and you're trying to restrict what ip addresses a user can connect to so doing it wrong often leads to vulnerabilities like for example server-side request forgery and users of F5's big IP product, uh, be aware there is a critical update available for you. This update fixes CVE 2023-46747. It's an unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability as root. It's actually interesting and there is is also a very detailed write-up of the vulnerability already out that has been published by Praetorian. It's a request smuggling vulnerability, but a little bit different than some of sort of your standard vanilla kind of request smuggling vulnerabilities in that it involves the Apache JSERF protocol. Now, first of all, request smuggling is really based on the idea that you have one TCP connection, you have multiple HTTP requests being sent over one connection, and in particular, middle boxes can get confused as to where one request ends and the next request starts. And if they are then trying to, for example, extract a URL to do some access control, well, uh, then things can go wrong if I can sort of smuggle a second request that they treat as payload and then later down sort of the bucket chain of proxies, some device is actually interpreting what used to be payload to the proxy server. They interpret that then as a new request. And essentially what's going on here, only that uh, it's not just HTTP, it's basically HTTP and the payload is uh, these Apache JSERF protocol messages, which is sort of where some of the confusion happens as to where they start and end. The end result is that you're able to use the configuration utility in F5's big IP without authentication, and that then pretty easily in the end escalates to the remote code execution. The simple fix here and one that you hopefully already have applied is that uh, this configuration utility should really not be available uh, from uh, the internet. Also, there is some additional uh, workarounds that you can apply that you can take from uh, F5's advisory. And even if you don't have any F5 products uh, but are dealing with web applications, take a look at uh, the write-up from Praetorian because it's a pretty good sort of case study in uh, what request smuggling uh, can do and how to exploit it. And it shouldn't be a big surprise that pretty much any CPU that uses sort of a multi-core, multi-threaded kind of architecture could potentially be vulnerable to some of these side channel attacks that over the last few years, well, we have talked so much about. The latest victim here is the M-series CPUs from Apple. Researchers from Georgia Tech, University of Michigan, and the University of Bochum have come up with a technique to exploit these side channel vulnerabilities in Safari. This, of course, makes this in particular dangerous because essentially it can be exploited by just visiting an arbitrary website. And what is being then exploited here is the fact that 
one window running JavaScript may be able to extract information from other windows running at the same time in the same browser. The basic problem here, you have shared hardware and by looking for these side channel artifacts in the hardware, you're able to basically deduct what else is happening on the system. This has been demonstrated in this paper to, for example, extract your YouTube browsing history or to recover some content from a Gmail inbox that you may have open in a, another window. Now, there is a workaround, at least for Mac users in Safari, you're able to disable swapping processes on cross-site window open, which basically avoids the use of these shared resources. And this prevents exploitation of this vulnerability. In iOS, there doesn't appear to be a setting like that that's easily sort of available. Well, and this is it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday.